All right, good morning, people and everybody. <laughs> All right, good to see you. I guess you needed this this morning, so I know I did. I've been uh, excited about this uh, study. Uh, this morning going to have a little bit of emphasis of what we discussed this last time uh, with victories and also kind of lead into some further study. Uh, we're still in uh, 1 Samuel 17, so if you'd like to go there to 1 Samuel 17, and we'll read the last two verses uh, of the chapter. And we've been talking about David, the life of David, and uh, now in, in this uh, portion about his facing the giant, Goliath, and how that went for him, uh, for Anybody that, uh, for the stature-wise, strength-wise, everything else, uh, maybe as the world would look on it, it appeared that this battle would go one way, but it went the, the Lord's way. Definitely not, I think, what a lot of people were viewing this to be, uh, as David had a victory, triumphed over Goliath. And the Lord can give us victories, He can give us triumph. And so glad for what he does for us, and he blesses us, and so thankful for that. So let's read these uh, two verses here. We're honing in on uh, just a couple of words of uh, verse 57, 1 Samuel 17. And as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son art thou, thou young man? And David answered, I am the son of thy servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. And we kind of focused in on verse 57. David returned. Goliath did not return the same. Uh, he met his fate. He met his end. His physical end, his earthly end, there and that. Did not meet his spiritual end. And that's a sad thought right there, that people are passing the scene. People are meeting their physical end, but not their spiritual end. People need the Lord. People need Jesus Christ in their heart and life. And if not, they have an eternal destiny in hell, eternal damnation, eternal death. They need that second birth. They need Jesus Christ. And uh, so glad that I had that second birth, and uh, I'm glad I had that first birth. I'm glad uh, in the days that we have now that there will be a lot more uh, people that will have a first birth, and so thankful for that, the things that have been done. Still a battle, still giants to be faced, uh, even in our days. And so let's pray, and uh, we'll bring some other uh, thoughts here. Uh, we'll go to the New Testament for a little while. And uh, David returned. David returned. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for this another opportunity to uh, teach uh, from your word. I do pray that you would help and give clarity, that your word would be clear to us. You'd give us understanding. You'd give us some help today, some challenges, and some help. I pray for lost souls to be saved. And I don't want that just to be just a constant prayer, something to say, but I want to, from my heart, dear Lord, say that I do want some people to be saved. And there's still, you have not returned as of yet to take us away. And so there must be some more that need Jesus Christ as Savior. And so I pray for those lost souls to be saved. I pray for us that you would change our hearts Make us better people for Thee. I know I need to be better for You. Please forgive me for my shortcomings, for not being as close to You as I could be. And I pray that You would just help us. Help us now in Your special way. Thank You for Your Holy Spirit guiding and directing us in Your Word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's uh, look. Uh, we see David return. Let's look uh, at in the book of 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and see some things that Paul wrote. Uh, we discussed a little bit about our victories, victories that we can have. When we have victories, 
we in turn give those to the Lord. If there's any glory for us to have, we, we want to give glory to the Lord. Uh, because uh, a wise man once said it's not about who we are, but who he is. And um, it's not about me. It's all about him. Right, Brother Steve? The wise man. Uh, it's, it's not about me. It's all about him. So look with me at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. do have uh, quite a few scriptures, and we'll go... Um, Hopefully to, to all of them, but we'll see as our, our time permits uh, today. And let me get these reading specs out. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Let's go, uh, uh, first of all, to verse 14 and following. Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God. In the sight of God speak we in Christ. I'm glad that Paul picked up about doing things in Christ, that his salvation was in Christ, his life lived was in Christ, the resurrection would be in Christ. All these things are in Christ. If it's not done in Christ, it really doesn't matter. And, uh, and Paul wanted to, wanted to specify that there are things to be done in Christ. And so he says, uh, we have a message and we have a message for, for those, a savor of death unto death and a savor of life unto life in verse 16. And we see Paul asks this question. He says, as I give the gospel to those that are lost, they can either accept it or they can reject it. There was a time in your life, and hopefully you took time to accept what Jesus Christ did for you. There are a lot of people that have somewhat of a knowledge of Jesus Christ, but they have not accepted his free gift of salvation, his free gift of eternal life. And so we pray for those people, and we want to do our best to reach those people and, uh, and see them saved. And so they could be in Christ too, as we are in Christ. And so Paul asks this question, who is sufficient for these things? Well, I have an arrow pointing over to another set of verses. As Paul says, where's my sufficiency? Where does that come from? Look at uh, 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 5. It says, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. And so where is our sufficiency? Where is our triumph in life? Where do those victories come from? Where do those things happen? They're in God, they're in Christ, our sufficiency is of God. So who is sufficient for these things? Who's sufficient to be able to give the wisdom and knowledge of salvation? Who is sufficient to save? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And God the Father has given us these things in his word. God is sufficient. And so the times that we, we triumph, where's that triumph? Where's that sufficiency come from? It is of God. You know, I can do some things on my own. I can do things, but, you know, the more that I try to do on my own without the Lord, I just fall and I fail. And we all do that. We all experience that. And so our sufficiency is of God. And we need to remember that, that he is the one that helps us to triumph in life. If we're going to win people to the Lord, our sufficiency has to be in Christ. It has to be of God. If we are going to help people in their daily lives, our sufficiency has to be of God. If we are going to give words of wisdom to help somebody and encourage somebody, our sufficiency has to be of God. And Paul realized that and he passed it on to the Corinthians. You know, the Corinthians were people that had a form of religion. And I hear that more and more 
uh, today, or I, I'm religious, you ask them about their salvation. I, I'm, uh, I'm, I, either I'm a religious person, or sometimes more and more, uh, you know, I'm not really religious. And, uh, you know, the more people tell me that, I'm not really religious. I, I didn't ask you that, if you were religious. You know, otherwise, maybe your answer would be the right answer. I'm not really religious, but that's not what I ask. I ask, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? That can or cannot be religion. People can have religion and not know Jesus Christ as Savior. And we know that. We could come in here and be the most religious people in the world. We can come be faithful in Sunday school, in church, be here Sunday morning, Sunday night, be here Wednesday night. Every time the door opens, Taekwondo maybe, I don't know, Miss Pam, but, you know, uh, whatever it may be and, be, and look religious and be somewhat religious and still be lost. And there are people that are like that, that are religious to some extent or another, that are lost and still need to accept what Jesus did. And it's not of themselves, it's the sufficiency is, is of God. All right, uh, 2 Corinthians um, 2.14 showed us that. Where is our sufficiency? Our sufficiency uh, is of God. Uh, look at Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. So glad that, that God did use Paul to write to these churches. These were churches, people that he tried to help along the way. And, uh, and, and he would write them letters when he wasn't uh, with them. He would write ahead and write them uh, letters of encouragement. Uh, he would write to them what needed to be done in their lives. Some changes to be made. The Lord to accept. All right, Philippians 4 and starting in, in verse uh, 10. And following here, the Bible says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding, ye have well done, that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity." Not because I desire gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Salute every saint in Christ, Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you. All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. You know, uh, Paul did have some eloquent writing, didn't he? And I'm glad that the Lord inspired his word, and we have these things. We now have his preserved, inspired word uh, here. And Paul said he was instructed about some things. You know, we could just read through and, and miss some things here, but Paul had some instructions to follow. Would you look with me again in verse 12? This is how Paul was. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. So there's, there, he, he knew about both realms there. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need. That sounds like some mixed instructions, doesn't it? But we can be content in whatever state that we're in. Is it pleasant to be in hunger? Is it pleasant when we're being abased? Those times aren't pleasant. I, I feel a little hungry now. It's a, it's a strange thing. If I don't eat something before I head out because I'm not hungry at the house, I'm hungry by the time I get to church. I know there are times when I'm hungry. 
There's times when you're hungry. Sometimes it goes more than just that food. A hunger for other things. Paul said, you know, I know that to be content. Because why? My sufficiency is in God. Paul said, I know that there's times when I'm going to abound. There's times when I'm going to suffer need. You know that we can praise God when we abound, right? When things are going good, when things are going the right way, which is our way, something like that. We know we can be, we can praise the Lord, we can be happy in Him, we can be joyful. Those are the glorious times when we're abounding. But what about those times when we suffer need? Can we still be content in the Lord and know that He's working things out? We've all been there, right? We've all been places where we have been in need, where we've been in hunger. We've had those needs. How did we handle it? Did we handle it with content? Did we still praise the Lord? Or we say, I just can't believe this. For all I've done for the Lord, all my service to Him, all my following Him, and this is what I get. This is the thanks I get. Some people do that, don't they? Sad to say, I've done that before. Lord, why? Why? I mean, you know, I've tried to be faithful to you. Why is this happening in my life now? Or why is this happening to those around me? Whatever the case may be. And I was not content. I don't mean we don't have to be concerned about things going on around us. That we don't need to pray for things as we see them going on. And of those times of need and those times of hunger, we say, uh, well, I'm so content that, uh, you know, I'm not concerned. I don't think that's the same thing. But I believe that we can triumph in Christ. That our sufficiency should be of God. You know, it's all in Christ and it's all about Christ. Look with me uh, back at Philippians chapter 1. And let's tie this in to, with it here. Philippians 1 verses 1 through 6. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day unto now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. I mentioned it before that God is always working. He's always working. He never slumbers. He never sleeps. He's always working, and he's working on you, and he's working on me. And God did a work. He did a marvelous work in me. November 5th, 1981, when I was 19 years old, God began a work in me, and he worked his salvation in me. I didn't have to work for that salvation because the work was already done on the cross of Calvary. What about with you? Have you relied on Jesus Christ so that work could be done? He knows how to begin it. He knows how to finish it. And he is not a process that we go through to be able to obtain salvation. There's not eight steps or more uh, to be saved. Um, those types of things. You know, we talk about uh, people being saved. We want to see people being saved. But that water has not saved anyone. They might have been saved coming back out. We didn't lose any yet. And I'm so glad of that. Pastor, you know, has, has dumped quite a few and haven't lost the first one. So uh, we're on a roll. Uh, but that water does not save. Uh, your good works. Um, you know, all the Hail Marys, whatever, wherever you want to go with this. And our sufficiency is not of ourselves, our sufficiency, our salvation, everything about triumph and about victory is in the Lord and in Jesus Christ. And so Paul wrote to these Philippians, it sounds a whole lot better reading through Philippians than maybe uh, the, the letters that were written to Corinth and to others. You know, churches are different. People are different, right? And you can really talk to people different ways. Uh, maybe some than, than you do others. Sometimes there's a harshness. It may sound harsh. Sometimes uh, there's a, an exhorting, a rebuke as we talk with people. Uh, that shouldn't be the, the only thing that we do is go around rebuking people. But uh, sometimes, not in, even in a holier-than-I 
uh, holier than I, holier than thou situation, anything like that. But some people need to be shown the truth. And some people are living in sin, and they may even be a Christian, may even be somebody that you believe is saved, is, is professed to be saved, uh, that just needs the truth and needs, needs some help. I know we have people in our church that are praying for loved ones that they're, they're just not sure, maybe not uh, showing any kind of fruit that these uh, relatives or, or maybe some friends that they're saved. All right, so our triumph is in the Lord, and we want to see people saved. We want to see them uh, be able to go to heaven, be with the Lord forever and forever. Uh, look with me again at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's read a few other verses we didn't read earlier. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7 and following. Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that you might be exalted? Because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely. I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man. For that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. And so, and I think I had actually written, I read the wrong one, didn't I? I was wondering why that didn't seem to tie into what I was talking about. All right, 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7. I'm glad that he did give the truth of, of Christ. All right, 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7 and following. All right, this should make a little more sense to you here. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul, are you weak? Yes. Are you strong? Yes. Sounds like a contradiction, right? People say there's contradictions in the Bible. This looks like a contradiction, but it's not. For when I am weak, the Lord Jesus Christ shows himself through me. God shows his sufficiency, and I am strong, but it's in Christ. It's in Christ. Not my sufficiency, but it's of God. Paul says, most gladly will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I want God's power, and I want God's strength. And sometimes it may take me going through some trials and going through some troubles for God to have the triumph, God to have the victory, God to be sufficient in my life. And so Paul was that way. He said, so be it. If that's what has to happen for God to be glorified, if it has to come down to me being weak or looking like I'm weak, however you want to look at this thing, so be it. I'll be content and the Lord will show himself faithful and he'll show himself victorious. He will show himself sufficient. And so it, it's strange. The world doesn't understand that. A lot of times we can't come to grips with it, with what the Lord's doing in our lives. And sometimes those things will tend to make us what? Bitter, right? Instead of better. I don't go looking for trouble. I don't pray for myself to be weak. Uh, those types of things. But Paul said here, that's what I glory in. Those infirmities that I have, those weaknesses that I have, I can still be content and I can still show that Jesus Christ saves. I can still show that I'm in Christ and I can still show that my sufficiency is of God. You know, verse 7 said here, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, 
There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan. Different people have speculated on what that thorn in the flesh uh, really was. Different uh, thoughts about that. I jotted some things down that Brother Donnie Pollard had mentioned about this. He said it could be personal, physical, painful, persecuted, things that are prayed over. They can be permanent, but they can be provided for by grace. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. And I think that thorn in the flesh could be a multitude of things. It could be just about anything. And sometimes that thorn in the flesh can tend to turn us away from God, from uh, taking our faith off of Him and our focus off of Him. And so we need to be content. I need to be content. Maybe I'm just trying to teach myself today that I'm, I'm the one that needs to be content. In my weaknesses, in my infirmities, the Lord will still show Himself faithful. Look at verses uh, 9 and 10 if you're still there in 2 Corinthians 12. Verses 9 and 10, he said, my grace is sufficient for thee. And, and verse 10, I take pleasure in infirmities and all these things for what? For Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Do we do the things that we do for Christ's sake? Or do we just do them? I say it's a sad testimony, but many times I just do them. And the things that I go through, I don't see the good, and so I just go through them. Paul said, I glory in my infirmities. He's taken notice of his infirmities, of those weaknesses. He's noticed some things, and maybe some other people have noticed some things. Maybe people were, were able to ask, Paul, how can you keep going like this? Has anybody ever asked you that? Is that it looks like you've really gone through some tough times, and you've been going through it for a while, and... How do you keep going? Why do you keep going to church? Why is it that you still go and listen to that preaching? Why is it maybe that you still share verses with me that you've come across? So obviously you're still reading your Bible. Why? Aren't you going through infirmities? Aren't you going through some tough times? Shouldn't that just get you down? Shouldn't that depress you so much that you're in peril, you're in distress? These things could get us down, but our triumph needs to be of God as we go through these things and, and we do them with the power of God and the love of Jesus Christ. We can still do those things. And so that messenger of Satan, whatever it is, don't let it take your focus off of the Lord. Don't let it disrupt your faith in him. Uh, just keep going for the Lord. Uh, what do you think about David? Was David weaker than his brother Eliab, you know, Eliab's the one that smarted off to him, you know. What are you doing here? You just come to gloat, to make fun, whatever you're, you're doing here. Uh, you're boastful. Go, go back to those sheep. Who was the weaker one there? You know, as people looked, it might have looked like David. Maybe he was the younger, maybe not as strong. Maybe, maybe wasn't as intelligent as what Eliab maybe should have been. Who was the weaker one there? Who was the weaker, David the shepherd boy or tall Paul? Tall King Saul, head and shoulders above the people. Who was the weaker? Who was the weaker, David or the lion? You know, going into that fray, I would have thought David would be the weaker. How about the bear? How about this? Who was weaker, David or the giant from Gath named Goliath. You know, we have some outward appearances, don't we? And sometimes we appear to be weak, but oh, what is God working inside of us in that inner man, trying to make us stronger? We can appear weak, we can be weak at many times, but God can still triumph, and our su sufficiency can still be of the Lord. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 2 Corinthians 3 in verse 18, uh, going into uh, also chapter 4, a couple of verses here, verse 18, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord 
are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. What are we doing in the sight of God? Paul says, we faint not. Why is that? We've received some mercy. We've received some sufficiency of God. And so we faint not. We are to show off Christ, aren't we? What kind of job are we doing at that? People still need the Lord. They need the Lord very much so. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4 and verses 3 and following. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ the, Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So where is that excellency? Where is that triumph? Where is that glory to go? We can be successful in life, can't we? And we want to be successful. We want to be successful people. Uh, sometimes our, our vision, our, our pictures of, of success uh, may not be attained, may not come up to the standards of the world, uh, but we can still have power. We can still have sufficiency of God. And that's where this excellency needs to be. It needs to be in the Lord and not of us. Look at verses 8 through 10. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Do you show the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. As we walk in this world, we try to have a walk with the Lord. We try to have a sufficiency in Him. And many times we're troubled. We're in peril. Paul says we are troubled on every side. Every side. He said it was coming from all over the place, yet not distressed. We're not going to fret about these things. Our triumph is of God, right? We are perplexed, but not in despair. The things that uh, we kind of wonder about, the things that, hey, I, I just don't know why these are going on. I don't know why. And they, maybe there's some, some doubts that arise because of some things happening in our lives, but we shouldn't doubt the Lord. It says uh, we are uh, not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. God doesn't want to destroy us. When things uh, that he allows in our life uh, come around, maybe sometimes that aren't so pleasant for us, God's not trying to destroy us. He's not trying to beat us down. But can we just see in our weakness, can we see his strength as our sufficiency is of God, as we try to live a life in Christ? Do we clearly show Jesus Christ to others? Let's look back at 1 Samuel very quickly, and we'll finish with this. 1 Samuel 17. We read there the last two verses there. We'll show again. 1 Samuel 17, verse 57, 58. And as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine Abner took him brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand and Saul said to him whose son art thou that young man and David answered I am the son of thy servant Jesse the Bethlehemite if you remember we read verses 44 and 45 and they say this this is when 
Goliath still had his head. Goliath still had his life. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air, to the beasts of the field. Then David said, Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Who looked to be weaker in the beginning? David did. It looked like this giant Goliath could just wipe the floor with, with David. He could have his way. He could be victorious. He could be triumphant. And then the armies of Israel would be subject to the armies of the Philistines. The people of Israel would be subject to the Philistines, would have to serve them. David said, you come to me with all these things that make you look stronger. The sword, the shield, all these things. But I come to you in the name of the Lord. I believe that David knew his, where his sufficiency was. David knew that his sufficiency was of the Lord. How could Paul say, I know where my sufficiency is? Where is it? My sufficiency is in God. Because he knew about David, right? And we could read about David. We could read about others. We could read about, about Paul and know that as he claimed, it was true that his sufficiency was of God. But how about on a personal level? Can you say, my sufficiency is of God. I'm going to do everything that I can and know how and not in my strength, but in the strength of God. I'm going to do it in Christ. I know I couldn't save myself, so I'm not going to be triumphant unless I triumph in, in Christ there. I know that the many things that I try to accomplish for the Lord, I can't do it by myself. My sufficiency is of God. The things that I want to say, I want to see other people saved. I want to see other people grow. What can I do? I'm weak. Well, I can be strong knowing that I can triumph in the Lord and my sufficiency should be of Him. There's a song that goes like this. Be not dismayed, whate'er be tied. God will take care of you. Beneath His wings of love abide. God will take care of you. God will take care of you. Through every day or all the way, He will take care of you. God will take care of you. That's a good song and that's a good thought. God took care of David. God took care of Paul. Is God taking care of you? Where is your sufficiency? Where is our triumph? It's in Christ and our sufficiency uh, is of God. And we can have victory in that. I can enjoy that. As weak as I am, I can still have triumph in God. Where are you today? Where are you today? Heavenly Father, do thank you for your triumphs, your victories. I thank you, dear Lord, that as weak as I am, I'm frail. I'm just flesh. I, uh, I can't do things on my own. When I try to do things on my own, I just fall and I fail. May our weakness be a strength. And may the things that we can accomplish be accomplished in you. I believe that you can triumph, that our sufficiency can be of you. And so I pray for that. I pray for mighty works to be done, uh, even in the preaching time, as pastor stands before us and gives your word today, there can be some triumphs. People can triumph over death, hell, and the grave because they can accept Jesus Christ as Savior. Others can triumph in, in right living, in a holiness for you. And lives being changed. We want that triumph, dear Lord. Would you please grant it even today? Thank you for going forward with us. May we go forward with you close by your side and have a close walk with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.